Does this make you as uncomfortable as it makes me? Good. Then you are normal. So here is part one of our history of forensic science video lecture. Now, um, there will be another part to this, obviously, because it would be weird to have part one of one. Uh, but what we're going to look at is we're going to look at kind of um, pre-modern uh, forensic science, where this wasn't exactly real forensic science, but just kind of little blips along the timeline of history where people did things that were uh, kind of beyond their time. And so we're going to look at that, and then the next uh, portion, part two of this video, is going to have um, a lot of really important information on uh, what got the ball rolling with modern forensic science. First thing, though, something we haven't talked about even yet here. What does forensics mean? Or what does forensic, the word forensic, mean? Um, this is a Latin word. It's a very old word, and it means belonging to the forum. Okay, Some people would say belonging to the court or belonging to the forum. So to find yourself in ancient Rome, and there is a, crim a criminal case brought up or a civil case that's brought, brought up, it would be brought before the forum where you have different experts or you'd have different witnesses that would come in and um, basically kind of give speeches you know, and discuss um, what they thought actually happened using great detail and precision. Okay, um, Now that ended up ultimately getting applied to forensic science because this is a science that belongs to the forum or belongs to the court because everything you do is ultimately determining someone's uh, guilt or innocence and so it needs to be greatly detailed and it needs to be precise to be able to be uh, exhibited to the court. So that's something you would definitely need to know for a test is the meaning of the word forensic and what does it come from. So we said with our historical overview here, we're going to, everything before the 17th century for the most part wasn't real forensic science, uh, but some of the framework that does develop by that. Uh, and so let's talk about um, basically how someone may have been charged with a crime uh, prior to about the 17th, 18th century or so. Uh, I will give you a little, little graphic here. And now this wouldn't be every crime, but this would maybe be a really heinous crime like a murder or a rape or something like that. There would be a confrontation by whoever was accusing you of that crime. Uh, and then, you know, if, if there seemed to be validity to that claim, um, something might happen like torture. Okay, we don't normally use a whole lot of torture these days uh, to, uh, to determine... Uh, the guilty and the innocent. But let's say that you would be tortured. Right here we have a lovely drawing of someone being on a stretching rack. Uh, maybe it would be some form of uh, waterboarding type torture or, th or things like that. But you would be tortured and the thought would be that if you confessed in torture then you were obviously guilty because you confessed. Uh, and if you had the strength to resist the pain then you were obviously innocent because uh, you were granted that strength because of your righteousness and your virtue and your heart. You obviously you did not commit, you know, commit that particular crime. Um, <laughs> not exactly a perfect system. Okay, so um, let us all be thankful uh, that we have uh, progressed a little bit further than the, than this method. Because if you have a low threshold of pain, someone might just like, you know, pinch you on the arm and you all of a sudden you confess to some horrible crime. All right, so here's our historical overview. We're going to go all the way back to 44 BC, okay? Um, we have a guy named Antistius who uh, was the personal physician to Julius Caesar, okay? If you know anything about Caesar, he kind of he met a pretty bloody end uh, at the hands of his uh, good friend Brutus, as we see here, uh, at least in the Shakespearean lore here. Um, and so, um, Antistius was the first, he performed the first known autopsy, uh, like legitimate autopsy. And he was able to come to some conclusions, whether they were right or not, we don't know. But he came to the conclusion that Caesar himself was stabbed 23 times. It's a little bit of overkill. No pun intended. Uh, and so he was stabbed 23 times. And so what he determined then that it was actually the second blow of the knife uh, directly into the heart that is what actually killed him, that all the other wounds maybe ultimately would have killed him, but were superficial, that second wound is what actually killed Caesar. So we have our first autopsy that takes place. Now the next couple of these are actually going to take place in China. And now ignore the really weird and creepy picture of that pig. Thank you, Jeff Buccino. Um, 
Now we're in 3rd century AD China. There was a particular book that was published called Yi Yu Ji. Hopefully I'm saying that right. If not, I'm sorry. But, but basically it meant a collection of criminal cases. And so this had some semblance of science um, that was applied to these cases. One particular, um, one particular case that I found fascinating uh, is the case of there was a husband who was burned to death. Okay. Um, where his house had caught on fire and he had burned to death. Now the officials or the coroner or whoever was looking at whoever checked over this body after the fact um, noticed something interesting that the body had no ashes in the mouth. Okay, And so this aroused a little bit of suspicion uh, because the wife of, the, of this husband had sworn that this was an accident that had taken place. And so what that official did is they took two pigs, okay, one alive and one dead, and they burned both of them, hence the lovely picture you see here. This is, I think, an actual presentation of how this took place. And so um, the pig that was alive when it was burned, yes, they burned the pig alive, had ashes all in its mouth. However, the pig that was dead did not. Okay. And so upon this evidence, whenever they stated this fact, um, the wife then confessed. I had some students ask me, well, what happened to the wife? She was probably dead as well, or killed as well. And so she confessed because she had been found out. This is third century China, though. I mean, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good description of the scientific method, though. Um, 8th century China, you have fingerprints uh, were first used for identification. Uh, there's clay pots. Uh, I think we have a little bit of a, an example here of clay pots using uh, where they use fingerprints to identify who it belonged to uh, and also to certify some documents. Now, we get to 1248 AD in China. Uh, this, is, this is actually pretty important. Um, the first forensic science book is published. I'm not even going to try to pronounce the, the term, but it has a, a wonderful name, The Washing Away of the Wrongs. Sounds very emo and, and emotional there. Um, the washing away of the wrongs. This was basically a forensic uh, slash medical book that was written um, that discussed how you know how to tell the difference between certain types of crimes and how they how they committed. And so it was like, it was a reference book. Um, it had some very interesting things like how to show the difference between someone being sh uh, strangled, okay. Uh, or a person who just naturally drowned. You know, how would you be able to tell the difference between that? Um, and there was one particular story that I have to share in this that was that's really interesting. Um, where we have Sung Zhu down there. Uh, it has our, one of the first recorded cases of entomology, uh, which is, remember, we, that's dealing with um, insect life cycles and, and using insects to determine uh, who, you know, how long a body has been dead, things like that. Um, there was a murder that had taken place uh, where somebody was stabbed to death with a sickle, which is a sickle there that you have on the, on the screen. Uh, and so what Sung Zhu, who was a, he was a, basically a medical, medical examiner of the day, uh, he, he gathered everyone in the village and had them take out their knives and sickles and things like that and had them lay them out on the ground. And so what happened is that when they laid them out, over time, Flies came and collected on the sickle that had been used for the murder weapon because it would have it would have recently had blood on it. They would have been drawn to that, and so when all the flies landed on that particular knife and sickle, yet again the murderer confessed to his crime um, because I'm sure he thought it was some sort of wonderful witchcraft and trickery that they had figured it out. But honestly, it was just good science. And so we go ahead 400 more years. And we have Marcelo. I don't really know how to say this well. I don't know if that's Malpighi. I want to say Malpighi, like the piggy that we just had, or, or however that goes. My, my Italian is um, a little rusty. And so he was the professor of anatomy at the University of Bologna, not Bologna. Okay? Uh, and he looks a little bit like Russell Brand, so I had to throw that in there. Um, being a professor of anatomy, he recorded. Um, all of the differences between fingerprints, and we'll get into this in a lot of detail later on in the year, all of the different ways that your uh, that fingerprints kind of form and, and shape. Um, however, in a wonderful blunder, he did not acknowledge that they're used for identification. 
uh, but he was one of the first ones to really map out um, and, and give a lot of information about the differences of fingerprints. And so that right there is our part one. Uh, we will come back for part two that will have a lot more information about modern forensic science. Until then, have a lovely life.